Thrive podcast. I'm your host, Phoebe Lay, and in each episode, I will be sharing with you insights from either an inspiring person or myself to help you thrive and shine online and in person. We talk about all things marketing, relationships, money, business, growth, mindset, and more. Mina, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. Phoebe, absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. You are actually my first guest this year, so it's really exciting. And I'm I'm very much looking forward to having this conversation because I think that this is not only going to benefit a lot of business owners and solopreneurs, but it's going to benefit the public in general. I I know for sure, given that you are not only a business and a tax advisor, but you're CTI qualified and you have such an ability to simplify the detail and communicate that to your clients. And so without further ado, I'd love to know, Mina, what is it that you do and how do you help your clients succeed? Sure. Okay, here we go. Phoebe, really to to summarize what we do is we have open conversations with our clients around what their desires are for their business, what their goals are for their business and personal life. We work with them to help them grow the business. And at the same time, make sure that they're paying their fair share to the ATO and nothing more than that. The work that we do is all legal and it's about minimizing tax. Minimizing tax means is understanding the law, how it actually applies and ensuring it is being applied uh, favorably to our clients. One question that I have to ask is, what is the definition of minimizing tax? Is that the same as tax avoidance or is that is there a negative connotation to that? Tax avoidance is more about avoiding tax completely, whereas tax minimization is about le- using legal avenue to reduce your tax. Everything that abides by the law, it's about understanding what you can and can't deduct, the appropriate business structures to use, depending on the business that you're conducting. Uh, It's about ensuring the assets are also protected. So some people have uh, various businesses and they have various projects that they conduct. So it's always a good idea to ensure that these different types of activity are being protected. And anything that could get pear-shaped in one activity won't completely wipe out another activity. Uh, And I mean, one area that we've seen a lot of volatility in uh, recently is uh, something like hospitality and the building industry. Hospitality because of COVID, not a lot of people are coming in. And with uh, the building industry, the rise in costs, which have wiped up profits and put a lot of pressure on the building industry. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I think that obviously, you know, there are, like you say, businesses that are doing multiple different things maybe they have two two separate companies for example i've got i've got my existing business thrive and shine co and i've also got my company targeted 360 digital and so sometimes for a business owner it gets kind of confusing because you've got multiple different accounts different cards uh you know your your bookkeeper might get confused is this a transaction for this business or for that so How do you simplify things for your clients? How do you make sure that when it comes to tax time, it's not, they're not trying to, you know, get things done in a a frenzy? Have a bookkeeper. The accountant works with a bookkeeper. So our firm works uh, or focuses predominantly on advisory and completing tax returns and the financial statements. We don't do bookkeeping. The accountant works with the bookkeeper and vice versa. The bookkeeper should be maintaining transactions, making sure things are reconciled on a regular basis. Depending on the size of the business, that might be daily, weekly, fortnightly, or monthly, right? Just depends on the size of the business and the transactions that are coming through. The bookkeeper should be asking the right questions in terms of which transaction relates to which entity. Having said that, the business owner should focus on paying whatever expense that they're incurring or whatever revenue that they're generating, right? Making sure that that goes into the the correct bank account, which is connected to an accounting uh, program such as Xero. So once we have that in check at a higher level, the accountant, business advisor can look at what each entity has done performance-wise and say if you're using a trust or if you're using various other 
entities, they could say, okay, well, maybe we distribute this or we provide a dividend of this amount to make sure that we have maximized the benefit to the client, which also includes paying as as little tax as possible, but at the same time, making sure that the client's standard of living is maintained. Mm. And that's obviously different to tax evasion. And, you know, you were talking about um, tax avoidance um, and how that's avoiding tax. What is tax evasion? And is that is that something that co- people should be afraid of? Well, tax evasion is, is one step further away from, from tax avoidance, okay? It's, you know, you're going out and about intentionally uh, making sure that, you know, you don't pay tax, the activities that you do are not on the books and so on and so forth. So really what people should be focusing on is how do I make sure I'm abiding by the law in terms of reporting what I earn, claiming the correct deduction, and understanding the tax system, working with a tax advisor and business advisor who understands the system, who can apply the law favorably to them. So that way they can sleep easy at night. And, you know, with tax evasion and all those kind of, I mean, you can you can make some money, but how long will you hold on to that? Mm. Right? Statistics, I believe, will eventually catch up to you. And it's great if you make all this money, but one day you get locked up in jail, you lose all that money. So what's the, what's the point? Yeah. So we always, yeah. So we always focus on what is the right thing to do and ensuring we are applying the law. We understand the law, right? Right. We understand what to do from a tax perspective. We understand what to do from a, a business perspective because the corporations act uh, also comes into this consumer law comes into the various things that business owners do. And so it's it's important to work with various professionals, accountants, business advisors, lawyers, people in marketing, uh, bookkeepers, so on and so forth. It's a group of professionals working together to look after our client. Mm, that's fantastic. Now, I mean, I'm, we're just going to um, steer a different, uh, you know, steer into international waters, so to speak. I know that there's been new tax measures that have tightened the rope on Australian businesses and businesses that are across the globe. You know, in the past, people could start up a company, for example, in Singapore and maybe be paying less tax, et cetera. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, the the shadow economy has also now been rebranded um, and, um, you know, I guess the Black Economy Task Force is something that's taken place and um, businesses, you know, uh, the, well, the ATO is cracking down on businesses and, and that's happening all across the, the globe. What is something that business owners should know about, especially if they are operating overseas? Sure. So in terms of operating overseas and even operating in in Australia, uh, people believe they can pay less tax if you operate in another jurisdiction, okay, or if you operate your business, say, through a company, right? We need to look at how the business is being conducted and the nature of the profession of the business, okay? Say, if it's nationally, if it's in Australia, uh, there's something called personal services income. If you are in the personal services income area, which means such as as a lawyer, um, as an accountant, as a doctor, we're earning something called personal income. So if the structure itself is not generating, if there is no system that's generating the income, then by law, you need to get taxed on that in your own name. And you can be operating a company or a trust or whatever you want. The tax law will pretty much pull that money, the profit from that entity and push it into your own tax return. You can't with anybody else, okay? Internationally, from an Australian perspective, what you got to look at is where is the business uh, being conducted? Where is the mind of the business? Who controls this business? If the controlling mind is in Australia, if director meetings are being held in Australia, then 
more likely than not, then the this entity is an Australian entity and will be subject to Australian tax. This is a very complex area. So it's something that you need to deal with on a case-by-case -case basis. You need to speak with an accountant. You also need to speak with, with someone who works more in the international areas because every uh, jurisdiction has its own laws and there's tax treaties. So again, it's about professionals working together to find out where the business is actually being con conducted. It's a question of fact. Where is the business being conducted? And where are the shareholders based? Uh, so on and so forth. And you build from there. Mm, it's very, very interesting. Uh, and, you know, obviously at the moment, um, especially after COVID and the way um, the Australian government has changed how it's looking at tax debt and it's obviously stepped up its you know efforts as well to collecting outstanding tax debts there's a lot less leeway there's new measures that have you know seen taxpayers um, you know refunds being offset and obligations are being disclosed now to credit agencies as well there's so much kerfuffle have you found that there's, um, you know, in this time, especially since COVID, has that affected businesses? Like, have you seen any um, cases in particular where um, because of the way the ATO have stepped up um, how it's, you know, dealing with tax debt, have you seen um, any businesses struggle with that or, you know, what can business owners do to make sure that they, they don't, um, you know, fall into, um, I guess, liquidation sure the ato's approach generally is if you do the right thing they're looking to work with you it's really that simple okay so throughout the COVID period if people have been lodging their business activity statement uh completing their tax returns even if they weren't say able to pay for whatever reason the ato would work with them to find out what they could pay and enter into payment arrangements to make sure you know they, they can pay their debt. Now, where things get harder is, is where people don't cooperate with the ATO. They're not lodging their tax returns. They're not lodging their business activity statements. And therefore, the ATO issues things such as direct penalty notices because there's no cooperation. And once that happens, the director becomes personally liable. So you no longer have the veil of corporation. Okay, now we're moving on to more legal territory here, but the veil of corporation really is is what uh, is the barrier between the company assets or the company operation and the personal assets. Okay, so once you have a director penalty notice, then the director is personally liable, including. Uh, putting their assets on the line to meet this debt. So the authorities are more likely than not willing to cooperate if the people themselves, the business owners, are looking to cooperate. So what I can say is lodge whatever needs to be lodged on time. If you have an issue with that, reach out again through your accountant, business advisor, uh, whoever, whatever the professional uh, the profession is, uh, and look to be proactive and communicate early rather than late. Absolutely. I think that the key is definitely communicating with the ATO as opposed to avoiding, um, you know, like seeing a letter and, and 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 just avoiding it and just putting it under the pile and going, okay, well, I'm going to get around to it. I'm going to do this. I think it's really important that people obviously work with a professional like yourself um, or even people that specifically negotiate with the ATO uh, and help business owners to, you know, come to um, a, an agreement with the ATO that, you know, gives and, them the support. Yeah, and business owners tend to stress. Okay, so we see a letter that's come through. Uh, we're so focused on what we're doing. When it comes through, we sort of think to ourselves, oh, what is this requiring me to do? Oh, no, what's happening here? And so... Sometimes, you know, we put our head, uh, our head in the sand, right? Yeah. That That's not the best idea, okay? Just reach out, communicate early, be proactive about the things that come across to you.
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the last thing that you want is for the ATO to be pursuing you for overdue tax. And, um, you know, like you mentioned, the fact that, comp- you know, company owners, directors are personally liable, that's huge. There are people out absolutely. there that have a family to feed, that have, you know, a house or a car that, that could be taken away from them if they don't take action. So I think for the listeners that are tuning in today, the the key is that, Rather than avoiding um, the ATO, you should be obviously lodging your tax returns on time, but make sure that you are communicating with them or having a, a professional, um, you know, communicate with the ATO so that you can reduce and resolve any tax debt that you may have, especially if you're, you know, if you've been doing really well for some time, um, but, you know, maybe maybe you've spent that. Um, and, and that's, that, those are things I'm guessing, um, that happen, right. That cause, I mean, yeah, Mina, what does, what causes a a business to suddenly have such large tax debt? One of the biggest ones is not budgeting. So when the GST comes, uh, becomes due and payable, instead of having an account there that you've already transferred funds across to. What business owners might do is, is leave the GST figures, the amounts, in their business account, They're just their everyday business account, and spend that money, okay? Or pull that money out as drawings or whatever, right? So when the time comes to make the payment, the funds aren't there. Mm. And so it becomes this vicious cycle of, okay, I can't make the, I can't pay this debt, I can't pay this debt. So- One video I've got on my YouTube channel is the various business accounts people should be opening. It's not just business accounts. You can have these accounts personally. Personally, you can uh, set up like a holiday account, right, where you transfer funds every once in a while for a holiday you want to go. You want to go on, right? Uh, A house you want to buy. So you're saving for the deposit. It's about breaking all these things up. And a book that I recommend is called The Barefoot Investor. It talks about these various uh, personal planning, uh, investment planning tactics. Okay. So it's all about how do we plan? How do we manage? And this is where we're looking at proactive activities rather than reactive activities. Reactive is, is too late. Mm. Absolutely. And especially, um, you know, when you're under pressure and the stress kicks in and then all of a sudden it just gets really challenging to to be able to think clearly, right? And, and I think that that's also the case when it comes to tax time. I think a lot of businesses or just people in general when it comes to the tax return time, all of a sudden they've got a pile of receipts in a shoebox. Um, they're thinking, you know, what else is coming up and they haven't been prepared. Uh, and I know that, you know, for me, that was the case when I first started out in business a number of years ago. Um, and then I got a bookkeeper and that that really helped reduce the stress when it came to tax return time. I, I think I got a heart attack when you said uh, shoebox full of receipts. <laughs> I'm thinking, God, no. Uh, Look, uh, as I mentioned before, make sure you're working closely with your bookkeeper and with your accountant. There is incredible software out there these days, such as Xero. They've they've got an app. You can take photos and pretty much HubDoc. So with HubDoc, you can take – it's the same thing as as Xero. So Xero has an app uh, and it's got HubDoc. So – Zero itself, the app, you can take a photo and code it right then and there. HubDoc can take the photos of the invoices and then that is accessible to your bookkeeper and they can code it from there, right? With consultation with you to making sure to make sure that uh, things are being coded correctly. I, I definitely think that the shoebox strategy is, is not a good strategy. It's definitely not a good strategy for business who are doing, you know, say, six, seven figures in turnover. That's no way to run your business. And it's no way to grow your business because really uh, business of that size might be looking at frequent reporting rather than just completing their tax returns and financial statements. So it should be maybe say quarterly in time with the business activity statement or maybe even weekly. How have we tracked? Where are the sales? 
Uh, what have we spent our money? Do we need to cut back the spending? Do we need to increase the spending? Say on advertising, because we're really looking to grow. Uh, is the assets, as in inventory that we're selling, are the services that we're providing, are they the correct services? You know, well, what's the revenue from these? So it's all about drilling down, looking at the sales, what each product or service has generated, what the margins are for those products and services, and making critical decisions, strategic decisions based on that intelligence. So if you if you have a shoebox, uh, it's it's a bit hard to make those decisions. Yeah, definitely. And I, I and I can hear that you're speaking from experience there as well. I'm sure you've had lots of different clients come to you at different stages of their growth. Mina, I'd love to know, how do you help established businesses develop a plan that will stabilize their tax costs and ensure that they continue growing in a steady and consistent way? Sure. That's a good question. The first thing we want to focus on is business growth because tax is paid on a percentage of the profit. So first, what are the products and services that the business owner is to sell and it's having frank conversations, candid conversations with the business owner to determine what is best for them. We don't always have the answer in terms of what is best, but we are able to ask the right questions to derive at what is working and what is not working and then navigate with the business owner to see how the business can grow. From there, it's looking at what is deductible, what's not deductible. You mentioned, for example, you've got two businesses. One is, can you mention the names again? So Thrive and Shine. Yep. So we've got Thrive other one. Yes. and Targeted 360 Digital. And Target. And what do these two businesses focus on more? So Thrive and Shine would be more social media content creation and mentoring. Whereas yes. targeted 360 digital would be like the full suite. So for example, uh, creating a Facebook ad or a website and more digital marketing, uh, you know, Google ads, et cetera, anything that's outside of social media. Okay. All right. So beautiful. So you've got two activities that work together, but at the same time, you want to keep those separate. So in terms of that, again, we look at those activities and say, okay, what's the risk in having these businesses working together under one, say, structure, under one entity, and what would be the pro and con of having them separated? So again, we look at asset protection. We look at tax minimization, or also known as paying the right amount of tax and not a dollar more, right? Because at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to reinvest these amounts to grow the business. When we grow the business, it means more employees, so we're supporting more people. We're looking after families, and we're looking to look after communities too, right? Because at the end of the day, healthy businesses support communities, and they're the backbone of our society. So it's having an understanding of all those things together. So really, going back to it, we want to look at how to grow the business, working closely with the business owner. And number two, how to minimize the tax. They're the two things. But one of the first things is actually is, is understanding a business owner's why. Why does a business owner do what they do? What are they passionate about? Uh, who do they want to look after? Is it their family? Is, is, is community important to them? Is legacy important to them? So it's having an understanding of all these very, very important questions and then making sure that the activities, the day-to-day -day things we do are aligned with those questions or with the answers to those questions. It sounds like you really empower the business owner to focus back on their vision and their mission and uh, and not to steer away from that and get distracted. That's a very, very important word. Hit the nail on the head there. It is all about empowering the business owner and understanding that the business is an activity they use to do something else, something substantial right? Whether it's, and you know, people make money and it's not just about the money. The money is always a tool. So it's, what are we using this tool to do? What's our ultimate objective? Mm. 
Thank you so much for what you've shared with us today, Mina. Um, I'd love to know if there's if there's anything else that you'd like to share on today's podcast, maybe a forecast for the year ahead for businesses uh, or, you know, perhaps maybe, you know, some final words that you want to share, some insights or tips. Maybe considering that uh, we're pretty, pretty early into the 2023 year, I highly recommend business owners have some time to themselves away from the business of day-to-day life and find out what course they are looking to to take, right? What path are they looking to take? Look at their why. Why do they do what they want to do? Uh, family, legacy, community, those types of things. What does, what does their business empower other people to do? What does it do for their network, right? And then from there, go about doing the things that are aligned with that vision, with that path, with that purpose. Uh, now, a really good book is is the uh, Japanese concept of ikigaya, right? And it's about understanding, you know, what what you're passionate about, what you're good at, what society demands that the 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 um the demand uh, on on the particular service or or uh, product that you can provide, right? And there was one last one I escapes me at the moment, right? But it's all about aligning those various things together to make sure you're doing something uh, that's on purpose, that's going to really fill your heart, but at the same time will help you grow both mentally, uh, physically, your character, and at the same time help you build wealth, right? Because again, money is a tool. So it's, it's having a healthy understanding of money and how important it is as a tool. It's like anything else, it can be used for good or for evil. At any point in time, we can decide to use it for good or for evil. So it's about focusing again on what our why is and leveraging those things to grow personally and help people around us. Yeah, that's so fantastic. I think you've, I, I really think you've hit the nail on the head and thank you so much for what you just said and shared. I truly, truly believe that business is about finding that right balance between purpose, impact, you know, legacy community, but also making wealth, like building freedom for yourself because making money and wealth isn't just about greed. It's actually, it's actually about freedom. It's, it's about family. It's about choice. So I think what you do and what you've said there is fantastic. And I love that, you know, you've shared that so eloquently. So thank you, Mina. Pleasure. Well done for the podcast and the content that you pu- you produce. Uh, looking forward to it actually going out more and more and affecting more and more people. So well done. Thank you, Mina. And you again, it's such a pleasure to have you. Um, I really, really admire what you do. And guys, for those that are listening, please make sure to follow Mina. Um, you know, follow follow him and his business as well. Um, you know, they do amazing things. Uh, and Mina, if you could maybe share with us how people can can find you and follow you, whether it's through Pinnacle or through yourself. Sure. So we're available on uh, the various social media platforms. We have a YouTube channel called Busy, B-U-S-I, Health, Busy Health, uh, Business and Health. Uh, we share a lot of content uh, on that. A lot of it is advisory level, very, uh, very empowering stuff. Okay. The, the various bank accounts, the video on that is actually on the YouTube channel to manage your liabilities. Uh, and what else? We're on Instagram. We're on LinkedIn. So if you would want, I can share my link in tree with you. Uh, we can post it somewhere for people to reach out. Also available, obviously, by email and by phone. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. We'll definitely be putting that into the show notes. And for those that are watching or tuning in, make sure that you also, if you can, leave a, leave a review. Tell us what you thought of this episode. Um, get in touch with Mina if you need any financial advice or business advice. Uh, you know, he's got an accounting advisory um, called Pinnacle, um, which is great. They help so many businesses across Australia and the world. Um, and Mina, once again, thank you for being on the show. It's been a pleasure to have you. Likewise. Thank you very, very much for your time. So thanks for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you inspired to thrive.